So we're talking about immune therapy, and unlike bladder cancer, lung cancer, where you really see great objective responses in a quarter of patients, it's very, very different in prostate cancer. Uh, we do see survival benefits with the drugs that we have, uh, but it's not necessarily as obvious as we would, we would like it to be. So this is the current state of immune treatment for prostate cancer. Cipulosal T is FDA approved for asymptomatic men with castrate-resistant prostate cancer. There's a survival benefit. We generally don't see PSA declines. We don't see objective responses, but the patients live longer. And this was a, a tremendous amount of controversy that was, was seen with this treatment initially uh, from the standpoint that uh, a lot of oncologists didn't believe it. Well, now with immune therapy, we realize that PFS is not necessarily the right endpoint to look at. With checkpoints, PD-1 or PDA one inhibitors like atezolizumab or pembrolizumab, uh, we see response rates of about approximately 10% in unselected patients. But if you select for patients with MSI or microsatellite instability, that's only about 3% of patients overall, but the response rate's about 50% in those patients. And there have been trials that have looked at CTLA-4, which is a different uh, checkpoint inhibitor, and it's been not shown to improve survival in castrate-resistant prostate cancer, but that also may have been related to patient selection. So how can we improve upon immune therapy, and how can we use clinical trials to do this? Well, this is just sort of a cartoon that summarizes how the immune system works. We have an antigen that's released by a cancer cell that's presented to the T cell, the T cell then is primed, and it infiltrates into the tumors, and killer T cells come in, or CD8 cells, and they eventually kill the cancer cells. So there's two sides to the immune system. There's a supply side, which is presenting the antigens, activating the T cells, and then there's the demand side, which is the, the checkpoints, shutting down the immune system. And cancer cells can actually become stealthy, like the... Uh, cloaking device from Star Trek, uh, where the, the immune system is uh, evading uh, or is, is being fooled and doesn't see the cancer cells. So we need to overcome that. So there are different ways that we can do this. So let's talk about the supply side first and some of the other areas. So we can use immune therapy early in the course of disease. We can turn a cold tumor into a hot tumor. What do I mean by that? Well, if you look at a prostate cancer specimen under the microscope, there are a few T cells that are present. And what we'd like to do is bring those T cells in. And that can be done by combining vaccines, which will present antigens, and combining that with checkpoint therapy. Combining uh, checkpoint agents also can be another way that we can approach this, immune therapy plus chemotherapy, and there are other novel approaches that we can use as well. So let's first take an old drug, Cipulosal T, or an old treatment that we've had for a while, and see if we can improve upon that in terms of our patients and what are the clinical trials that are going on. So uh, Larry Fong, a number of years ago, did a neoadjuvant study on prostate cancer specimens where he gave Cipulosal T, which is a T cell product, prior to radical prostatectomy. And what he found was that there was T cell infiltration within the prostate cancer cell, and he compared that to the original specimens. As you can see here, uh, it's at the tumor interface between the stroma and the, um, uh, and the, and the cancer. And uh, he looked at various markers like CD3, CD4, FOXP3, and also B, B cell markers like CD20. And the interesting thing that he found was that as patients were treated, pretreatment biopsy, and then the radical prostatectomy and looking at the tumors, you could see that in the treated patients, there was a rise in CD3, CD4, CD8 cells, and the untreated patients, the controls, you didn't see it. So uh, this, this is leading the genesis to a clinical trial called Provent, and uh, this trial actually accrued incredibly quickly. Uh, it's a randomized trial of Cipulosal T uh, versus observation in men with localized, low-risk, favorable, or intermediate prostate cancer who are not undergoing radical prostatectomy. They have to have a ISUP grade of group one or grade two. And these patients received three infusions of CYP-T, and then they're observed with sequential biopsies as well as uh, how you would normally observe a patient on expectant observation. So this makes a tremendous amount of sense. You would think that immune therapy works in low-volume disease. We would use this earlier in the course of disease, and potentially we may be able to prevent patients from going on to surgery, as David said earlier. So I think this is a very, very interesting trial, and we'll see what the results are of ProVent in the future. Now, CYP-T also is being combined with other agents, and um, there are a lot of agents that we're trying to improve the immune system with. Using two different checkpoint inhibitors, a tezolizumab uh, or ipilimumab, CYP-T is, 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 being, uh, is being combined. Uh, these trials are still underway. Uh, Radium-223 and CYP-T 
CYP-T as well. There's some scientific rationale for that because radium does cause an immune effect. And then other immune agents such as inamoxamide uh, are also being combined with CYP-T. And if you want to try to reference these trials, I put the uh, National Clinical Trials numbers on the uh, right here. Okay, vaccines, bringing the tumor cells uh, the, the, uh, the, immune aid, the immune cells or bringing the immune cells to the tumor cells is a way that we potentially can augment checkpoint inhibition therapy. This is a trial that is a multi-institutional study that we're actually participating at Yale. Uh, it's uh, a, looking at a vaccine-based immune therapy regimen. It's a chimp adenovirus uh, that's administered intramuscularly and it's given a DNA plasmid boost and uh, the epi epitopes being looked at are PSA and PCA as well. And this is being combined with tremolumumab and it's, a, it's an escalating phase one do, a study that we're now in dose expansion. This is being evaluated not only in men with castrate resistant prostate cancer, but non-metastatic PSA rising patients. It makes total sense if you want to avoid hormone therapy, rather have a vaccine uh, than uh, giving hormones and, and the potential side effects that come, come along with it, particularly if they're asymptomatic and have non-metastatic disease. This is also a theme that's going on with Merck. Uh, there's a randomized trial that is being planned of pembrolizumab plus enzalutamide and hormone therapy uh, versus enzalutamide and hormone therapy alone in newly diagnosed metastatic patients. So again, moving the, the, this, this treatment up earlier. Combination therapy. The, nivolumab is a PD-1 inhibitor. Ipilimumab is a CTLA-4 inhibitor. Both different targets on the T cell. And in combination, they seem to synergize. So pa Pam Sharma did a phase two trial combining Nevo plus Ipi at different dosages in men with castrate-resistant prostate cancer. Remember, I mentioned before that uh, ipilimumab failed in a randomized trial, predominantly due to the fact that the visceral disease patients actually did worse. Had it been only bone patients, it would have been a positive study. So these are the baseline characteristics of the patients in the study, 45 in each, ar each arm. One's Ipi-3, Nevo-1, and the other one's Nevo-3, Ipi-1. And the bottom line here is, is that we do see responses, again, not to the same degree that we would see with other solid tumors, uh, a 25% objective response rate in measurable disease in cohort one, 10% in the other. Uh, PSA response is fairly modest, 17.6% versus 10%. But again, when we start trying to select out the patients who do the best, those who have high tumor mutational burdens are the ones who do the best overall you know, with this particular treatment. So this may be a selection factor for our patients. I'm not sure that this treatment is going to be the right, right one to use in men with castrate-resistant prostate cancer because of the fact that there are significant toxicities with ipinevo. And in fact, what you're doing with this is doubling your checkpoint toxicities uh, with this combination, so uh, compared to a single agent. Um, on to other combinations. This is a uh, trial that's being sponsored by Bristol Myers Squibb. It's a forearm study. One arm has been reported at, uh, at ESMO, excuse me, three. Uh, Rucaparib uh, combined with nivolumab. Rucaparib is a PARP inhibitor. Docetaxel uh, nivolumab and nivolumab and enzalutamide. There is uh, justification for this combination based upon some data out of Seattle that showed that there was synergy between Pembro and enzalutamide. So the only thing that's been reported at this point, and this was at ESMO, uh, was the docetaxel nevo arm, 41 patients, 34% had visceral metastases, 46% had a PSA decline of more than 50%. That's not particularly striking, but there does seem to be, at least in terms of a radiographic progression-free survival, uh, and this is not completely mature yet, 8.2-month uh, median. You would expect the median to be about six. Uh, this is leading to um, a randomized trial of docetaxel plus Nevo versus docetaxel alone uh, that uh, Bristol-Myers Squibb is, is, is sponsoring. Pembro plus Olaparib is also being looked at in castration-resistant prostate cancer, uh, PFS of 48% of, of uh, at six months, 14% uh, response in measurable disease, PSA response rates of 12%. Again, not particularly... Um, exciting, uh, but again, what we have to start looking in, in terms of with immune therapy is survival. So these, these are, are numbers that I think are reasonable to look at, but, but again, the survival is the end point. And this is just a graphic representation of the same thing, a 14% response rate by resist uh, in measurable and a 12% for the total population in terms of PSA. 
Uh, Pembropus docetaxel, again, this is a three-arm study that Merck is doing as well. 72 patients, 31% PSA response rate. This is the reporting back at ASCO this year. Measurable disease, 23%. RPFS at six months of 45%. Now, this is the concerning part. There were two deaths from pneumonitis, and this is a known side effect of taxotere. It's also a known side effect of Pembro. So this is something we have to carefully watch while the patients are in the study. Same thing we mentioned before, Julie Graff's data, Pembro plus enzalutamide, uh, PSA response rate 27%, but note that this is in patients who fail prior abiraterone. So this is a little bit higher than what you would expect, and a six-month RPFS of 50%, uh, which I think is pretty good, uh, again, considering the population of patients. And this, to me, is one of the more par promising combinations that, uh, that is going forth. And in that same venue, there is a randomized trial that Genentech has done, which is uh, finished accrual and hopefully will report out very shortly. Uh, Tezeluzumab plus Enza versus uh, enzalutamide alone, 750 patients, or 720 patients randomized, international study. And this is similar to that same concept before about the combinations. So what's out there in terms of clinical trials? Well, uh, I mentioned before, and I'll disclose that I'm one, one of the PIs on this, the docetaxel Pem pembro trial, randomized trial of about 1,000 patients. Internationally, we've got, we were accruing a little slowly at this point, but we hope to pick that up shortly. Uh, we've changed one of the entry criteria. Dosi plus, uh, plus or minus nivolumab, the che checkpoint 7DX, uh, that's open in accruing patients. Enzalutamide, plus or minus pembrolizumab, Keynote 461, that, that's open in accruing patients. And also an elaborate plus or minus pembro trial is now being planned. So what about other approaches to immune treatment? And you know, this is one way, then let's go towards the cellular aspect, and something called a CAR T cell. This is an approach that is FDA approved for patients with uh, lymphoma and leukemias. And basically, the patient's own T cells are removed from their blood by apheresis. And you insert particular cancer-specific genes, and you make these particular CAR T cells. It's a very expensive process. And then a chimeric antigen receptor is developed. These T cells are grown up, and they're infused back into patients. Now, it's not as benign as the, the process with Provenge. Uh, there is something called cytokine release syndrome. These patients do require hospitalization for their initial treatments. So it's not a particularly easy treatment to go forth with. And again, in an elderly frail patient, it may not be their best way to go. And this is just a graphic representation of the CAR T cell, which will track the macrophage and cause tumor cell death. So uh, there are uh, other, uh, about three trials in the United States and a bunch of others internationally that are looking at different targets. Uh, this is looking at PSMA, and another is looking at PSMA with a TGF beta construct uh, in patients with castrate resistant disease as a conditioning re uh, mechanism to remove the uh, T suppressor cells, either cyclophosphamide or cyclophosphamide plus fludarabine are administered. And then there's another one that just simply looks specifically at PSMA. So again, you, you can refer patients for these studies if you're so inclined. So um, since this is a breakfast meeting, we'll talk a little bit about bites. And what is a bite? Uh, a bite is a bispecific <laughs> bad. It's a bispecific antibody uh, that basically takes two antibodies and fuses them together. So you've got an antigen binding site that can bind things like PSMA, prostate specific, any, any of the stem cell antigens, or uh, the second portion, which can bind the CD3 cell within the T cell. And then this can cause tumor cell death. And there are a number of different trials that are looking at bites, and there was one that was actually presented uh, last year, AMG212, which had, was a bite that looked at uh, PSMA combined with a uh, CD3 antibody, and lo and behold, anti-tumor activity, 50% uh, PSA declines were observed. Again, this is a phase one trial with dose escalation. But nonetheless, that we're seeing something I think is impressive. And again, the same thing we've got to look for, cytokine release syndrome. This is something you have to worry about with the bites, and this can be a significant toxicity. So there are two trials that are either accruing patients or opening up with the bites at this point. Both are Amgen-sponsored trials. One is targeting PSMA and CD3, and these are castrate-resistant prostate cancer patients who failed Abby or Enza and one chemotherapy, but not more than two uh, chemotherapy regimens. And then the second is looking at steep one, which is a uh, which is a prostate antigen combined with CD3. And again, this is an angiogen sponsored trial. So this is one that I think again you should look out for and potentially accrue patients to. 
So in conclusion, CYP-T and pembrolizumab are, uh, for, particularly for MSI high patients, are the only FDA-approved immunotherapy agents for CPRC. Phase three trials are evaluating checkpoint therapy with chemotherapy as well as dual checkpoint inhibition. Vaccine therapy is currently being evaluated along with checkpoint inhibition therapy uh, to improve uh, PSA response rates.